This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Author Garrett Conley published his first book, Boy Erased, in 2016. It was a best-selling memoir about his childhood, his father, a missionary Baptist preacher, and his own experience undergoing conversion therapy at 19. It inspired a major motion picture two years later. This hour, Conley will dis- discuss his newest book and his first foray into fiction, All the World Beside Explores Queerness in Puritan New England. Set in 1700s Massachusetts, it's about a love affair between Arthur Lyman, a physician, and Nathaniel Whitfield, a reverend. And joining us now is author Garrett Conley himself. Garrett, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And for readers and writers, fans of Conley's work, or even of Nathaniel Hawthorne or Arthur Miller, both of which we will be talking about today, you can join the conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So Garrett, also known as G, I want to uh, get to the plot (laughs) of the book in a quick second, but Tell me first, now, what was the inspire for this book? It, and it sounds like your husband really sort of sent you down this path. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think right after Boy Erased came out, uh, my husband challenged me to write a book about queer Puritans. And on the face of that, I was kind of laughing <laughs> because I thought, oh, my God, first of all, this feels like a kind of SNL sketch. Um gone wrong. And then the other half of that was, how am I going to do all of this research to, to understand, you know, what that life could have been like. And, um, and so I dismissed it at first. And then after a while, I started to be haunted by that idea um, of discovering ourselves in maybe one of the places where it felt we were least likely to discover ourselves. And, um, and yeah, it led me down this sort of rabbit hole of research that um, had me reading as many Jonathan Edwards sermons as I could possibly read to try to understand Puritan thought. And by the way, um, Jonathan Edwards is such a genius that it's kind of intimidating to start there, sure. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> Let's start up high. Start up high. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, but what it did was I was able to sort of acclimate myself to the language of the time, um, at least formal language. A lot of these ministers were educated at Harvard or Yale, and um, and they were just incredibly whip smart. Um, and their sermons, which I found really interesting, their sermons were more like lectures that you would, you know, hear um, in a classroom, and they were very erudite and, uh, you know, a product of the Enlightenment. They were reading all the philosophers at the time. So it kind of, um, you know, the deeper I went into this world, the more intimidating it got, but then also the more interested I became in kind of um, incorporating this world into a narrative that would be maybe more familiar to someone like myself, who grew up in fundamentalist Arkansas, you know, a very... Um, small town in in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas where the church was just your whole life. And I started to see these parallels between, um, you know, New England at the time and what I felt I had gone through in the 20th and 21st century uh, in the small town in Arkansas. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, here I am. I, uh, I found so many letters that I thought were interesting at the time between men Um, And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But, you know, I gave myself permission. I slowly sort of worked my way into this world and and familiarized myself with with not only the culture, but also the language at the time. Um, And it was just a really fascinating journey. Right. And we definitely want to get into your research and, and the things that you found when you have jumped into that rabbit hole. So I'll definitely get into that in a little bit. Um, but I also want to get into the plot a bit here, too. And just for our listeners, there's mm-hmm. going to be a little bit of a spoiler. So if you don't want to know what happens, you know, turn away, but definitely come back again. Um, but and then also for our listeners who are not familiar, the primary the primary love story here is between Arthur Lyman, who's a physician, and Nathaniel Whitfield, who is a reverend. So can you talk about, you know, where does it go from there and how do you fold science into the story? Because it does play a role here. Mm. What a great question. I mean, so much of the book is about this sort of dichotomy and battle between the head and the heart, right? So 
<clears throat> that should not be unfamiliar to any of your listeners who <laughs> grew up a certain way or or who um you know have been in in many church services there's that pressure between what we think and what logic tells us and what our hearts tell us um has you know fueled many religious debates has really been the impetus for a lot of religious experience and um and yeah i think uh placing some of those concerns with science and the changing understandings that we had in the Enlightenment into the character of Arthur Lyman, who's a physician in the town, um, was a pretty smart choice um, because I was able to rely on a lot of, uh, you know, really obvious metaphorical language to get the point across because, you know, what what happens in a narrative like this where you're, you're sort of looking back um, – into a period of history where people did not have names for what they were or what they considered themselves to be. Um, If you were gay at that time, you might consider yourself to be a sodomite. I doubt it because you wouldn't want to be called that. Um, You might have heard of people like you in court cases, um, in police reports. There might have been a broadside that was passed around that was kind of a subject of ridicule. And so, you know, we didn't have positive labels for what we were in the past. And, and of course, we also don't want to impose, you know, presentism onto the past. But we also can't deny the fact that queer people have always existed in some form or another. Um, so that challenge of trying to make the, the modern reader who's entering this world understand what's going on, right. it requires... Um, some language that is familiar to us. And I think language that concerns the body um, and the heart uh, versus the mind, which is really gaining traction in the enlightenment in the area, right? Like um, all of these educated men, and I emphasize the word men, right? that that's, they were white educated men um, at Harvard and Yale. And many of them, most of them actually at the time were becoming ministers. Um, so within that world, you have this new pressure of, okay, so now what do we do with our feelings uh, now that we're learning about all these new things? Um, and, you know, philosophers at the time were discovering that, you know, we needed to figure out how to uh, control or corral the passions, right? It was all about um, maintaining control on one's heart and one's desires. And enter, you know, so that's going on right before the Great Awakening, which your listeners might know about. Um, You know, the Great Awakening was the big period of sort of revival and religious ecstasy that took over New England um, in the 18th century, in the early 18th century. There were two of them. And um, what what the Great Awakening really did, in my opinion, and this is a very, you know, layman's opinion, is uh, it it reinstated the body into the church service, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly people weren't just sitting um, very rigidly in their family pews. Um, They were, they were experiencing emotion. They were crying out. Um, Some of them were, you know, writhing on the floor. Um, And, and many of these moments of ecstasy to me read, um, almost sensual, right? So there was a kind of sensuality to um, some of these services that hadn't been there before, and people were allowed to express themselves in this new way. So the Great Awakening really um, gave me a, an even better sort of canvas for um, for some of these feelings. And then why choose a minister? Well, you know, my father's a minister, so that's one. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, he I've always grown up under... Um, his shadow, and it's not always been bad, right? Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from my experience uh, of of observing my father, but I have watched the toll that it has taken on him um, to kind of lead this group of people. He has about 200 congregants uh, right now, and he's at their beck and call every second of the day. And while he loves it, you know, anything that enters into his life that might be seen as unusual or uh, in any way um, unorthodox, right, with what people believe, uh, it it causes suspicion. And I know that that takes a great toll on him because he's not really allowed to be a human, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think uh, 
leaders, the 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 more the the <clears throat> I guess like the the further up you go in terms of leadership, right? Um, you become a little less human each time, <laughs> right. and that's what I've noticed in my father's life, and that's what I've noticed just in my very small um, way with activism is the more that I kind of became a a mouthpiece and the more that I started partnering with different organizations, it's like you can't really be a human. (laughs) Um, And so that was an interesting uh, challenge for my characters that were falling in love. Well, and and just by this description or just what you've been describing, clearly there are so many layers there that I know we can spend days just unfolding one of them and talking about, you know, your Mm -hmm. father, you feel like, you know, his experience really doesn't allow him to be human, which I think we do see in the characters of the story and mentioning the Great Awakenings. That's such a, a very pivotal moment for you learning about it. And it plays a very central role in the novel, as well as we have labels today that can that we know to put to you know differentiate or to allow ourselves to to understand ourselves better um, but those didn't exist at the time you know in, in the mm-hmm. time that you're 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 writing from so can you talk about how like all of these questions all of these all of these this knowledge that you're learning how did it deepen some of the the questions that this story is asking about faith mm. yeah i mean i think there were just so many challenges to this book and (laughs) hopefully you can't see all of them when you're reading them, (laughs) but uh, probably, you know, it took several drafts to understand how to peel back some of these layers and get to story, right? Just get to characters who are feeling things and who are moving the plot forward based off of their relationships. And that was really important to me in the book is that you felt as though these characters were alive and they were real. And one of the things going back into the book and revising for character did for me was it made me understand that, yes, there are a ton of differences between now and the period I'm writing about and New England. You know, I, I, I lived in New York City for about six years, but I, I don't think I could ever consider myself to be an expert mm-hmm. on New England. But um, there are a lot of these differences, but underneath all of that, we're kind of the same, right? I mean, you look at um, the kind of wave of Puritanism that has overtaken our country just recently again. Um, It never entirely goes away. It rears its head back. Um, And and what I'm referring to, of course, is is much of the right, which has, uh, at least last year, really got behind a lot of the rhetoric that Ron DeSantis and people in Florida were using, um, you know, like groomer um, and... And, you know, the anti-trans backlash um, and, and rhetoric that's been used across the country, the, the hundreds of laws that are currently um, in our country that are, are being proposed that are anti-trans, right? All of this is very familiar to me. Right. <laughs> you know, I grew up during the, the George W. Bush era of the marriage amendment, right? So trying to get to make it so that gays and lesbians could not marry um and and so this you know none of this feels new to me it's like okay let me check my watch and see when they're going to do this again <laughs> um and, and so even though these characters are um separated from us by you know a, a quite a bit of time and and for me space um they feel very familiar to me when i started to look and imagine their lives and read some of the ways that they, you know, letters were never private. Um, they were rarely private. They were read aloud. So everyone's sort of speaking to each other uh, across distances in this formal language that can often be very coded, um, which also felt kind of familiar to me. <laughs> you right. know, I'm, I remember, um, you know, speaking with people, and if you mention certain books or you mention certain um things that you enjoyed, it was meant to signal that you were a free thinker, right? That you were not, um, you know, fundamentalist. And, and that, that was my childhood is just sort of, you know, anything from, uh, you know, enjoying Harry Potter was seen as sort of evil. But if you, if you mentioned it to someone and they said, Oh yeah, I read that book, then um, you were able to sort of find someone that understood you within this very puritanical worldview. So I guess that that was kind of what I learned most of all by 
by focusing on character, focusing on story, it's really, you know, we're playing these different roles and that's not to diminish uh, the, the differences between now and then, but I do feel as though humans are just going to be kind of human, like you know, forever. We've always been kind of the same uh, for better and worse. Well, for better and worse, we are listening to Garrett Connolly, who will be sticking around and will be continuing this conversation after a quick break. You can join us. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Back with us to discuss his new novel set in 1700s Massachusetts is Garrett Conley, who's the author of All the World Beside and Boy Erased. And for our listeners, you can join the conversation as well. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So this is your fiction debut, Garrett, but you told NPR's Ari Shapiro that this is actually more autobiographical than Boy Erased, which was a memoir. Can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's strange how how fiction and nonfiction work, because in nonfiction, the constraint is really that you are a character, right? So, uh, you know, the I in nonfiction or memoir must be a, a sort of persona. It's a version of you that um, is completely coherent to the the reader and it relies on trust, right? So truth and trustworthiness are really what we're trading in when we mm-hmm. write memoir. And so you have to be a stable individual <laughs> who has really worked through all of the trauma and in my case, all the trauma and all of the um, sort of real therapy that I needed in order to be a real person. Um, And so that's required before you even sit down to write. In fiction, for me, um, it was much messier. And that meant that I was able to dig into parts of myself that would not necessarily make a coherent whole as a narrator. Um, I was able to sort of put parts of myself into each of these characters. Um, We have you know, Nathaniel, the minister, and Arthur, his lover, who's a physician, but we also have their children and wives. And um, and so I was really interested in exploring, like, what's it like to be a minister's son or daughter at that time, which I know a little bit about, you know, just right now, as my, as my father is a minister. Um, and And then, you know, just the fact that you can put you can sort of put your own um, experiences into a novel and then walk away and say, okay, it's all fiction. <laughs> you, know? you don't have to uh, claim any of it, which I'm enjoying right now quite a bit. <laughs> well, I, I, I think we can feel your enjoyment really with, with the story. I think what I found that was really um, uh, fascinating was how accessible the language is really. And I definitely want to get into the characters of the wives and the children in a little bit. But I think an important element with this book, uh, All the World Beside, is that you explore the love between father and son in different ways. And you've also spoken about how you see your father in Nathaniel. Can you elaborate on that? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, again, that, that sense of leadership and responsibility, of course, but but also Nathaniel's a very tortured individual. Yeah. <laughs> he he um he wants to always do the right thing. He is very creative, like my father. My father, you know, I will trade poetry with my father. It's it's kind of something that surprised me. Um when we were trying to connect again uh after, you know, he sent me to conversion therapy and and I experienced so much pain and and hurt from him. I thought, okay, the language we're using right now is not working, so let me try a different one. And I sent him (laughs) Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which I'm laughing because anyone who has read that probably remembers that it's pretty steamy. You know, there are moments where he's kind of um, almost polyamorous. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's there's a bisexual feeling to me when I'm reading it. You know, he's very um, open. And, um, And so my dad reads it, and his response was, you know, he was quoting 
pieces of leaves of grass to me and then saying, man, that, that dude's weird, but he's got a way with words. And, you know, the, <laughs> those moments where my dad is able to kind of enter through a side door and look at human experience um, without the language that he's been taught his whole life, it, it's like the place where we meet. And I I started thinking about the places where people meet, right? Where do they, how do we get rid of the BS, you know, all the, all the language that we've inherited from our forefathers and all the ways we look at the world? How can we just look at each other as human beings and get beyond that into something much deeper, in my opinion? And, um, and in the narrative, you know, Nathaniel, our minister, he is constantly in his own head. He is thinking, you know, one second he's thinking about how nature is the embodiment of God's goodness, and the next second he's thinking about how he's dangling over the pit of hell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not a very um, uh, comfortable place to be, and I would know that, you know, and I feel like my dad knows that. And, um, and so that struggle was really important for me to portray in this book, um, I think, uh, again, it comes back to that head versus heart idea. You know, it's like the integration of a full human self is very difficult, if not impossible, within a kind of fundamentalist worldview. And um, and as much as things were changing at the time in the in this period that I'm writing about, um, you know, with all these Enlightenment ideas, there was a rigidity to everything. So, you know. Everyone in a town, you know, small town in Massachusetts at the time, um, if you were part of a Congregationalist church, then you were required to go up in front of, you know, all the congregants um, at the time and recite Bible verses and and really prove that you were doctrinally sound Mm -hmm. uh, so that you could prove that you had... Uh, you know, that you were one of the elect. And and we all, probably many of these listeners know that there's this idea of the elect, right? God has already chosen who will be saved from the pit of hell and who will, who will live forever in eternity with God and Jesus. And, and, um, and so you don't know ever if you're of the elect within that worldview, there's no way to know except for outward signs and so people were always looking for outward signs of virtue. They they needed to see, you know, that um, that people were in it for real because they were so worried that there were going to be, you know, charlatans that would come among them or, or people who would, um, you know, mess everything up in the town. And some of that is very understandable to me now that I've read so much of the period, right? So there's, there's a fear... Because basically, you know, this is colonization. There are a lot of um, Native Americans nearby who, you know, might not be happy with what you were doing to their land and their people. Um, there is, you know, earlier, not too long before the starvation, you know, there was, uh, there's a lot of sickness, typhoid. There's, there's just tons of stuff that's up against you. And you were trying to be as controlled and safe as you possibly can. So there's a kind of um, just extra control that is exerted upon the congregation. And it's really just like a pressure cooker, right? Um, A crucible, to use another word that I'm sure we'll refer to again. Um, You know, if you recall from Arthur Miller's uh, The Crucible, there is uh, a section where John Proctor's wife is asked to... um, name all of, well, I think it's, wait, it's John Proctor. Yeah, John Proctor is asked to name all of the um, Ten Commandments, and he stumbles at adultery because we know he's been having an affair with Abigail, and um, and that stumble causes people to question, you know, what's going on. I think it's Hale is the minister who's come in to to analyze everyone in the town and, and see who might be practicing witchcraft, and um, and so that that ends up being a moment of tension in the play where, you know, you can hardly catch your breath when that happens because you know what's going to happen when they figure out, you know, okay, if someone's having an affair, what's that going to do? It's going gonna, it's gonna to call everything into question. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's just a, a lot of pressure 
in that time period that can create um, a really dramatic story. Well, and we mentioned the crucible earlier, and it's so interconnected with the story that you've written yourself. Um, and you've also talked about the Scarlet Letter, and there are so many similarities between the Scarlet Letter, which is written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, and your new novel. But can you talk about, you know, what's been the significance of the Scarlet Letter in your life, even before you set out writing your first fiction? Yeah, I mean, it's funny how many influences are in this book. <laughs> but uh, I, it's, I, I'm obsessed with the Scarlet Letter. And one reason for that is that um, in conversion therapy, which I wrote about in my first book, Boy Erased, um, I was asked to create this genogram, which a genogram in, in usual therapy practices is a kind of family tree where you look at patterns, right? You look at patterns of abuse, you look at patterns of um, you know, substance abuse, things like that, and try to make sense out of your life, which can be very helpful. But in conversion therapy, of course, everything becomes a bit perverted. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were asked to make a genogram, so a, a family tree, and then next to everyone's names, we had to put these things called sin symbols. Um, and a sin symbol was anything that basically fundamentalist Christians believed was sinful. Uh, so that could be abortion. So you had to put an A, B next to someone's name who you believed had an abortion or who you knew had an abortion. Um, you had to put like a dollar sign next to someone who gambled, um, you know, and, and these would be equated with like an M for murder. So there was right. no, you know, if you gambled, you were also a murderer. If you were homosexual, which was an H, uh, you were also placed on the same kind of plane as a murderer. And, um, and, you know, within therapy sessions themselves, I was placed next to someone who was dealing with pedophilia. He had abused a child. Then I was, I was you know, my other side was someone dealing with his marriage. Um, and then there were children who, you know, one, one person there had uh, been caught, you know, they were labeled as bestiality because they were caught with their dog doing something stupid. <laughs> um, and... And we were all sort of placed on the same plane of sinfulness. Um, and and so the first time I read The Scarlet Letter, I had not experienced any of that. I was a high schooler, like many people, I'm sure, who are listening. <laughs> um, you encounter The Scarlet Letter too early before life has had its way with you. I was and actually just like, talking oh, about reading. that. Yeah, I was talking about that with our with our <laughs> right. producer. I feel like if I read it as an adult, the experience would be very different compared to when I read it as a high schooler. And same thing with The Crucible. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, you should really give it a go. The Scarlet Letter, um, it, when you read it when you're older, it has so much more significance. And, and, of course, there was a direct line here because when I read it again in college, um, I suddenly saw how this A which was almost exactly like the A's that I might have put on. And I think they actually used an A for adultery in the genogram. Right. <laughs> um, you know, there's a literal sort of sign on you that, that declares you as sinful to the world. And, you know, I had to put an H next to my name. And I started to think about that. And the deeper I went into that narrative, um, the more similarities I found to my own experience because Hester Prynne, our protagonist in The Scarlet Letter, she she must, you know, embroider this letter, but what does she decide to do? She makes it as beautiful as she can possibly make it, and she holds her head up high. She's carrying her child born out of wedlock, um, Pearl, and she is going out onto the scaffold where people are punished for their you know, sinfulness and, and asked to stand in humiliation. Um, and she refuses to do that. And in many ways, um, the pride that people are so angry about in her is the thing that keeps her alive. And, you know, eventually in the narrative, spoiler, everyone, if you haven't read the Scarlet Letter yet, um, you know, please do. It's still worth it. Uh, but, you know, she she starts designing um, embroidery for the townspeople, they start asking for it because they see how beautiful it is and they cannot deny her art. And so she takes this symbol of shame, this thing that she's forced to do, and she turns it into pure art, art that is desirable by the very people who condemned her. And the very people who condemned her won't look at her in the street, but they will wear her designs. 
And I just thought that is exactly how I'm going to go about life. <laughs> like, um, I'm going to take the things that were really shameful for me. I'm going to take the things that were really um, painful and things I don't ever want to look at again. And I'm going to embroider them. I'm going to make them beautiful. I'm going to turn them into something curated. Um, and so I think this is just a continuation of this new book even though it's fiction instead of memoir, I like to think of it as a continuation of that project. So get on to embroidery is what you're saying as well. <laughs> um, that will be your next project. I do expect you to come back to tell oh, us about it. And I, you know, and then because of what you've been saying too, I mean, it's so beautiful. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk about another H word, which is home, because in both books, mm -hmm. these lovers find each other and home in the forest. So can you talk about that? And when, why did you decide to use that as a link between the two stories? Well, you know, there's a lot of literature uh, in the time period in New England uh, in the 18th century about the wilderness. Obviously, everyone's very concerned about the wilderness. And, um, you know, it's there was this idea of, you know, they called, they called it uh, very problematically like the black man in the forest. And they believed that there was this dark figure that was um, you know, not everyone believed this. It was just sort of a thing that people often told their children to keep sure. them out of the forest. But it's it's a specter that haunted um, a lot of people. This idea that, you know, if you go out there, it's going to be the devil disguised. Um, and he's going to offer up his red book and you will sign your name in blood and he'll, in exchange, you'll receive infinite pleasure. Right. It sounds pretty good, actually, right now. <laughs> um <laughs> But, you know, it, it was really scary to a lot of people, and, and there were a lot of myths about the forest um, because, you know, this was colonization, right? This was um, a, an attempt, a successful attempt to um, claim new land for their own and find a new home, and uh, they were very scared to be outside of the civilization that they understood, and um, things were really hard. So the forest became sort of a projection of their shadow self in my in my sort of understanding their their anxieties went to live out there and I thought well you know that's true but you know I learned from the scarlet letter because Hester Prynne and Arthur Dimsdale the minister that she has her affair with they meet in the forest with Pearl in the daytime and it's this beautiful sort of um, moment in the scarlet letter where they're allowed to be human, really, and they're allowed to feel things. And you see, you see the real humanness in all of them. And I thought, okay, well, you know, there we go. There's the forest um, that's supposed to be this dark, evil place where love can actually flourish because it's not part of the Puritan world that has controlled their lives for so long. And um, but I also wanted the forest, you know. This happens early in the book, so I don't think it's a spoiler. Uh, Nathaniel, the minister's daughter, is really um, the first person to understand what's going on in the book because she sees Nathaniel and Arthur meeting um, in this forest clearing at night, and she doesn't understand it first, but she feels like something wrong has happened, that, that something unusual in her life is happening, and she's right. Um, but for her, because of the story she's been told about the forest, uh, she feels that it's all very dark, right? Um, and the book is really an attempt to change that sense of darkness into something light. Um, because to the outside world, to the casual observer of this, um, it looks like something secretive and wrong and very, um, to use Hawthorne again, you know, the short story, Young Goodman Brown, <laughs> where that character goes into the forest and, and believes that he sees all of the townspeople, you know, engaging in sort of satanic orgiastic things. <laughs> um, and then he goes back into the town and everyone acts normal. Um, and so I wanted my character, Sarah, to experience some of that and then, you know, come around a bit by the end of the novel. Well, and I, I've always found it so fascinating how we each interpret forest differently. And I've got one more question for you before we go to break. But 
Um, my producer, Katie Pellico, and I've been talking about this really as we are preparing for the show. And and she shared that the observation about the role of, of the forest was really what, what prompted her to fall in love with literature as well. And that the forest and what takes place there, especially in the Scarlet uh, Letter, represents that which is natural. So can you talk about, is that a better way to interpret and understand the wilderness? Because it is interesting that a lot of people find it as dark and scary, right? As you just described, yeah. but it's actually a very natural space. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, to to our Puritan adult <laughs> brains, you know, we, it's infused every part of us. So the forest, you know, and the wilderness, the idea of wilderness is both fascinating and often terrifying to people who who grew up sort of with that influence on them. Um, but of course, that's a very like Western concept that is very much, uh, you know, determined by the way that Puritans reacted to their own sinfulness, in my opinion, right? So the fact that they, you know, they're so concerned with their inner souls, they're so concerned with the forest and the wilderness, but but really they're what they're actually concerned about in my 21st century, you know, estimation is what they're doing, the violence that they're enacting just off stage, right? Like, even if that's soft violence, you're still pushing people out from their land. You're still, um, you know, doing pretty despicable things. Um, that's not to say that I don't, you know, uh, you know, in the book, I don't treat them that way because they're characters. But my own personal opinion is that the shadow self really is being projected into the forest. <laughs> you're, you're like all of your sins and, and all the secret anxieties you have go out there. Now I grew up reading, you know, I grew up in the Ozarks and there's force all around and I would walk in the forest. And it was kind of my escape. And so I really came to love the transcendentalists, right? Also, um, you know, Emerson, Thoreau, all those dudes, they were great, right? Um, they're, they, they were caught up in this sort of romantic idea of the wilderness and the forest, which I think is, is sort of the polar opposite of the fear of the forest. And I think the forest becomes, or the wilderness becomes um, whatever it is that we are sort of projecting onto it, if that makes sense. I think it, it doesn't deserve <laughs> all the things that we project onto it all the time. Right. I, 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 be, right. Know. I know. I, I think of it as a, as a friendly place, but I do get reminded like today is like, oh, that's right. Like, like the wilderness is, it can be a scary and fearful place for some people. Mm -hmm. So um, you've been listening to Garrett Conley, who will be sticking around with us and we'll continue this conversation after a quick break. You can also join us. Give us a call. Let us know what a forest means to you. 888-720-9677 or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. This hour, we're discussing a new novel exploring queerness in Puritan New England. And back with us is Garrett Conley, who's the author of All the World Beside and Boy Erased. So, Gary, we've been spending a lot of time talking about how you crafted the novel, what your experience was like. Can you tell us what some of the reactions to the book that you've been hearing? You know, what are you what what have you heard from readers? Oh yeah. I mean, I think that uh, people aren't really expecting the book to really explore some of the children's perspective in this because the book is, is very much marketed around these two men who fall in love. But I think the project of the book became for me about the families and how they, um, how they also struggled with their own reactions to these, these two men in love. And so I think some people are surprised by that, and I hope I hope they're happily surprised <laughs> by that. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think I've been surprised to hear that people think of it as a, a page turner because mm. <laughs> it definitely didn't um, feel like that whenever I started to write it. But I hope sure. it has a kind of propulsive readability to it. That's, those are kind of the two things I've heard so far. Well, and because your husband basically nudged you into this black hole that you fell into, and it sounds like you're continually <laughs> falling because that's the nature of a black hole. You know, what did your husband think? Yep. 
Oh, he loved it. I mean, he um, he he enjoyed how unusual the book is. You know, my husband has maybe the best taste out of anyone I've ever met. I, we once went to uh, a party at the great writer Edmund White's house. He's like, you know, my gay hero. Um, he's been writing, you know, gay literature for a very long time. That's been popular, and we finally got to go to his apartment and meet him. And they were, you know, my husband and Edmund White were talking for like, I don't know, 30 minutes. And I got nervous. I was like, what are they talking about? And Ed comes over and he says, do not ever um, leave this man because he knows more about books than I do. <laughs> so Shahab's opinion, my husband Shahab's opinion of my work is maybe the most important opinion that I can imagine because he reads, I think he reads probably a book a day. He's wow. an obsessive reader. Um, I love that, though. <laughs> and, yeah, so so he liked it. <laughs> <laughs> five stars from your husband. That's all we need to know. <laughs> oh, I don't know if it's five stars. I didn't ask him for a star rating because I'm too nervous. <laughs> all right. Like, I'll, I'll do that for you after the show. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and talking about a, a, a different reader here, and because your father has played such a huge role, of course, in, of, in your personal life and, and in your uh, fiction, nonfiction life, and you've talked about previously how your father has said he's never read Boy Erased, which is your memoir, and how you don't believe him. So have you have you heard from mm-hmm. him about this novel? You know, do, you, do you hope that he reads All the World Besides <laughs> as well? Well, I'm nervous about him reading it, but mm. I, I do, you know... I do have this image in my mind of when I see him next, I'll just hand him the book and I'm going to dedicate it to him. And hopefully he will read it. Um, I think that he'll be surprised by some of the, the takes in it. (laughs) I don't think uh, he expects me to be very generous towards religious experience or um, towards faith. And the thing is, you know, this book was a challenge to write in many ways, but one of the ways that, um, it was most challenging was that I, I tried to really capture a kind of possibility of queer Christianity or queer spirituality um, because I'd met so many LGBTQ individuals who came up to me after a talk on my first book or when we were doing movie promotion um, for the adaptation, you know, people would come up and they would say, oh, you know, thank you so much for not attacking religion. I am a queer Christian and it's a very hard path for me, but I want to change the way that people think about this. And, you know, I have heard from some really wonderful churches who have seen my continued effort to sort of allow for LGBTQ Christians to exist in my in my uh, fiction and nonfiction. And, and they I feel like they feel seen. Um, and that makes me feel good because uh, there's nothing incompatible really at the at the heart of things in in terms of sexuality and religious experience it doesn't have to be and in fact i would say if you if you claim that sexuality doesn't have anything to do with your religion then i don't think that you're looking very closely <laughs> at your religious experience um and 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 there's also just such a great tradition of uh religion and sexuality uh, in terms of poetry, in terms of great literature. You know, I I quote in the book John Donne, who is one of my mm-hmm. favorite poets uh, of all time, and he has a poem that will make your um, body tingle, which is called, <laughs> it's called Batter My uh, Heart, Three-Person God. Mm-hmm. And I, I really want anyone who's listening today that's interested in poetry who hasn't read that to read it, um, and it's, you know, he basically compares himself to a young maiden who must be ravished by God, or else um, he won't really be God. He won't belong to God. He'll be tempted by other, you know, another man. <laughs> and and that's the way that I read it. And, and you know, even when we talked about it in my um, English classes uh, as an undergrad, you know, we, we explored that possibility. We talked about how um, there was sexuality in that poem. And and you look at the poetry right now, a contemporary poet of Carl Phillips, who he, he writes beautifully about um, queerness and religious experience or faith. And so I think, I think there's a, a kind of growing movement of LGBTQ people um, getting the courage to write about these things because, you know, 
one of the things you do get when you write this way is a lot of hate mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and my, my email is not listed on any website or anywhere, but people manage to find me <laughs> and, uh, and send me their five page explanation about how David and Jonathan uh, in the Bible couldn't have possibly been gay. There's no possible way, you know? <laughs> um, so, so it comes, it comes with the territory, I think. Right. And we've only got about a minute and a half left. And, and then I want to get to one last question. You know, and this is a big question, but how, how did writing this book affect your own journey with faith? Well, I think um, it put me on a faith journey that I hadn't really uh, necessarily wanted to be on. <laughs> mm. But it turns out when you read a lot of theological uh, discussion and, and sort of look deep into the history of anything, you get invested, right? And, um, and, I, and some of my friends, I think, were a little concerned with how deep I went into uh, some of this thinking because I was trying to enter the head of Nathaniel Whitfield and, and understand this minister's uh, challenges. And so, uh, yeah, I think now, <laughs> I, I don't know if I would call myself uh, a Christian, I don't know if I'm comfortable calling myself that right now, but I do feel as though I have a faith practice that I didn't have before I started writing this, and it, it definitely is a journey, and I'm just kind of keeping an open mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, it's it's there's something there that is calling me, and I don't even like using that term because of my dad, but it's it's definitely there. Well, we've got about a minute left here, but, um, you know, as you continue on your own journey, what do you hope listeners or readers get out from this novel? Well, I really hope that uh, that all of you who are listening and, and maybe going to read the novel, um, that you keep an open mind about this, this uh, pressure between religion and faith practice. And, and I think it hopefully is going to heal some of the divide that we feel that we have um, in terms of like not being able to be something, you know, like, okay, I can't go to this church because I'm X or I can't go, I can't go do this because, you know, they're going to think X, Y, or Z. And I'm just hoping that this book opens up a kind of way of thinking that allows for contradiction or what feels like contradiction to just sort of exist in people. But but then, you know, outside of that, of course, I hope they like it. I hope it's a good story for them. I wrote it to be a, a drama that people really get caught up in and, and swept up in. And, and that's what I hope they walk away with. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us, author Garrett Conley. Thank you so much for your time and for peer pressuring me into rereading The Scarlet Letter. <laughs> Definitely. We'll get on thank that. Thank you so much, Kat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening and happy reading. Mm -hmm.